and welcome, and my name is John, and welcome to what I like to call is my backyard. <laughs> Those mountains are my front yard. This is my backyard. I mean that literally, because as a guide, part of my job is to live here on site, to keep an eye on the property after hours. And you may or may not be surprised to hear what people will do in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so uh, part of my job is to discourage that sort of thing. But in the meantime, welcome. Um, first off, uh, I like to begin by answering uh, the most common question I get asked. It's not, where's the restroom? It's, uh, is this the biggest meteorite crater or the only meteorite crater? And the answer is no uh, to both questions, actually. The biggest crater we know of, at least in the U.S., is not this one. It's actually underwater. It's off the coast of Virginia, near uh, Chesapeake Bay, where the capital, D.C., is located. In fact, nearly half of the bay itself is an impact crater. It's over 50 miles in diameter. And the biggest in the world, again, so far, is in the country of South Africa. And folks, it's over 185 miles, or 330 kilometers in wow. diameter. It's half the size of Arizona. These craters are so big, you can't see them anyway, unless you're from space. But the great thing about this crater besides the fact it's the first proven meteorite crater, is that for one, it still looks like a crater. Because the areas are covered by water or vegetation for the most part. It's extremely well preserved. It has filled up, but only about 150 feet over the past 50,000 years. But perhaps most importantly, it's conveniently located to six miles south of I-40. So I got that going for us too. But this is where the science of astrogeology was born and NASA still comes here, as well as other institutes. In fact, just uh, eight months ago, the astronauts were actually out here training. Now, this happened. Oh, any questions so far? When this happened about 50,000 years ago, again, folks, this is an estimate. No one knows exactly when this hit. They say no people were here. But imagine if you were here just prior to the impact. You have looked around and noticed a lightly wooded area but more a grassland than a forest. Just as flat as you see now, but much, much greener. You also would have noticed giant mastodon, buffalo, and camel, all grazing in the same area at the same time. Then you would have seen a light, most slightly from the east, getting brighter and brighter into within seconds is brighter than even the sun. Then you would have seen nothing as the energy of about a thousand atomic bombs was suddenly released. This is a conservative figure. Pretty much every living thing for 14 miles or 24 kilometers in all directions was either seriously injured or killed outright from a shockwave. And the meteorite itself, even though it's made of solid metal, 80% we vaporized instantly. The other 20% we broken up and ejected outside the crater, where the whole thing was found. The crater itself remained pretty much as you see it now for the next 50,000 years. Westerners would not take note until as late as 1871, when a U.S. Army scout named Franklin Benitez was passing through, and just by chance he came upon this crater. He made a note of it in his logbook, because his name was Franklin for many years, especially on Army maps. This famous crater was known very simply, if not crudely, as Franklin's in the 1880s, Hispanic shepherds began collecting chunks of metal all around the crater because they believed they contained silver. Eventually, a sample was analyzed, and sadly for them, the results come back negative for silver, but positive once again for 92% iron, 7% nickel, and even about 1% in uh, trace elements, including microscopic diamonds. This finally gets the attention of both prospectors and scientists alike, including perhaps the leading scientists in America, one of the most beloved scientists in American history. His name is G. K. Gilbert, and Gilbert is the head of the U.S. Geological Survey, so he's a very important man, especially out here in the West. Gilbert wants to come out here to settle a debate, once and for all, between two groups. Those who represent the Native Americans and say this, in fact, is a meteorite crater. And those who say no, it's a volcanic crater, like many of the European scientists. 
Gilbert comes out here and he's leaning toward the meteorite origin. But because he himself knows very little about meteorites, especially their speed and their power, after a brief survey less than a week here at the crater, Gilbert concludes sadly, if not tragically, <coughs> it's not a meteorite crater, it's the result of a so-called volcanic steam explosion. Now, if there's ever a case in the history of this crater where someone does a hundred things right, but is known for doing just one thing wrong, this has got to be it. It doesn't end his career, but certainly harms his legacy and a great <coughs> opportunity for science is lost. But because of his reputation, nobody challenges the great Gilbert scientifically for almost 20 years. That is until 1902, a man named Daniel Beringer hears about this from another man named Samuel Holsinger of the Holsinger meteorite fame. Holsinger works for the U.S. Land Department. He's telling Beringer stories over drinks down in Tucson about a giant crater in northern Arizona that locals believe was formed by a giant iron meteorite. And the meteorite might still be down there somewhere. At first, Beringer is skeptical. He's aware of Gilbert's report. century dollars. An iron nickel might just be needed to form the crater just waiting for someone to dig up. So Barringer conducts his own private survey and lo and behold he agrees with the locals. He ignores Gilbert, says this is a meteorite crater, and he very quickly and very quietly files for four mining claims, which are just as quickly signed by his good old ex-hunting buddy, then President Theodore Roosevelt. So it's good to have friends in high places, right? Especially back then. He begins to dig immediately. But because he's not aware the meteorite was in fact destroyed, he digs in vain for the next three decades. He digs, or drills, at least 35 holes, spends his entire family fortune, millions of dollars, encounters constant frustration from people who say it's volcanic. I've met people to this day who say it's volcanic. Then the stock market crash of 1929 happens. Within a month of the crash, Beringer suffers a massive heart attack and dies. And his family is now the proud owner of a big hole in the ground somewhere in the Arizona desert. At first, it's considered worthless. They even try offering this to the U.S. government. And even the government says, well, we already have the Grand Canyon, so thank you, but no thank you. So they decide to hold on to it anyway to honor their father's memory. That is, until the 1940s, they finally agreed to lease or rent at least the sides of the crater to the surrounding Bar T. Bar Ranch. And the ranch, later on, forms what's called Meteor Crater Enterprises, my employer, and the owner of all these buildings and facilities. This place is officially dedicated to education and tourism in the 1940s. That's what we've been doing ever since. But mind you, it was not proven until as late as 1960, almost 30 years after Barringer's death, when a scientist named Shoemaker found evidence of two minerals that previously no one had seen before except at nuclear blast craters in Nevada and in laboratories. That combined with the sheer mountain of data collected during the failed Barringer operation is what finally convinces everyone, at least in the scientific community, this in fact is a meteorite crater not a volcanic crater. That's the history in a nutshell. Any questions so far? <laughs>